to redeem us. That's why he lives. He not only lives, but he lives to continually redeem us. You know, we've all lost something in life, maybe many things in life, and Jesus lives to redeem all that we've lost. Uh, just as you'll see Boaz living to redeem Ruth in Ruth chapter 4. We're actually going to split chapter 4 into two sections, one today and one next week, because we're going we're to find two resolutions in Ruth chapter 4. One is the legal re resolution of redemption, and the other one is a community resolution. So we're going to look at uh, the legal resolution today, uh, which I call the, ro the romantic uh, redemptive resolution, which we all need. We all need a romantic redemptive resolution for our problems in life. So uh, before we get into this, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the way that you live and that your son Jesus lives um, to make uh, intercession for us. Um, he's able to save us to the uttermost, those who draw near uh, to you through him. And so, Father, we want to draw near to Jesus today. We, we pray that your word would speak to us um, and that it would point uh, to Christ, uh, that we would find our redemption in Christ, um, that we would live our life through Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let me ask you this. Have you ever waited anxiously in a court for some kind of decision that would determine the outcome of your life? Has anybody ever been in the middle of a court case? Maybe a few of you have, okay. And the decision uh, of, of the judge or the jury would determine what your future looks like. Maybe it would determine whether or not your future um, kind of ends right now or whether or not it continues. Um, well, Ruth chapter 4 is opening up in this way. Most of the scene is actually happening on the turf of an outdoor court at the gate of the city. And Ruth's fate will be the key issue of these court procedures. Okay, so um, Ruth's fate is dependent on exactly what is going to happen between Boaz and this other redeemer. Um, the question will not be, uh, if she will be redeemed, but more like who will redeem her. And I want to suggest that all of us, too, need all of our problems uh, dealt with in a legal, a legal way. Uh, Ruth chapter 4 is a mini example of how we need redeemed by, by Jesus. So uh, let's, let's look at this. Uh, first, let's look at the, the law of redemption. I want you, want you to, to understand what redemption is. Uh, within the context of Ruth because it's going to set us up for understanding what redemption uh, looks like between us and Christ. Uh, so you'll notice in, in chapter 4, between verses uh, 1 and 8, the word redeemer or redemption is referred to 12 times. Redeemer, uh, redeemer, redeem, 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 okay? Uh, you can underline in that, that in your Bible if, if you just skim through it. And so, the chapter is all about redemption. So, why is it about redemption? What is redemption? Well, let me remind you what redemption is. Redemption means buying back something that was lost. Ruth and Naomi had lost everything. Naomi lost her whole family. Uh, she, and, and when they left Moab, she also lost her land. So she didn't have land anymore. Of course, Ruth lost her whole family. And they had no hope of a future. And so they need that redeemed back. Maybe you, you, you can imagine redemption by the term redeeming bottles. When we redeem bottles, we redeem a bottle that has turned empty in order to, to recycle it and perhaps receive some cash back for it. Well, that's what's happening uh, in Ruth and Naomi's uh, life. Their life has been emptied. They're an empty bottle. And the whole story of Ruth has been the story of how God is working up to this redemption. He's going to redeem these old empty bottles. But the foundation of redemption sits on the context of an Israeli law. Okay, redemption, even the word that we use redemption comes from uh, Israelite law. And in their law, you could never ever permanently lose um, property, from family name. Family 
Family names and property uh, were glued together for eternity. Right? It was illegal to really sell your property permanently, forever. Uh, that's how it worked. And so redemption was God's way of buying back either a family name that was dying or a, a land or property that had been sold. And God assured this in, in three different ways. Okay, there was the year of Jubilee. In Leviticus 25, 8 to 22, the year of Jubilee would release all property back to its rightful owner and family name every 50 years uh, so that, that property could never permanently, permanently be sold. Uh, so, so actually, real estate value was gauged based off of how close or far away you were to the year of Jubilee. If you were three years out from the year of Jubilee, then you would sell your property cheap because that other buyer would only have it for three years and then they'd have to give it back. If you sold your property uh, 47 years before the, the year of Jubilee, then it would be expensive because that owner would have 47 years with it. So that's the year of Jubilee. Then there's the Redeemer. Uh, property could stay within a family name through a redeemer. Um, so uh, the redeemer had to be a relative of yours who would buy back the property that, that you sold or um, even buy back yourself if perhaps you sold yourself into slavery. And, but only a redeemer could do that. That's very important. Um, only a relative could do that. Not, not a business, not a friend, but only a relative. And so, uh, coming into Ruth chapter 4, Naomi and, and Ruth find them, themselves in this kind of situation. Uh, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. He's related to uh, Naomi's hu deceased husband, Elimelech, in some form or the other. And, and, but he's going to offer the land of Naomi that she lost when her family moved to Moab. And she, he's going to offer it to the nearest kinsman redeemer because he's an honest man. Remember, Boaz is a model man uh, for us to follow. And so the question of chapter 4 is who's going to redeem both Naomi's property and land and also uh, Naomi and Ruth? Uh, who, who's, it, who's it going to be? Uh, and, then, and then there's a third way uh, that God would, would allow both property and family longevity to continue. Um, and and this, this happened through uh, something called a Leverite marriage. You can read about it in Deuteronomy 25. It is very interesting. This is where, where I call this romantic redemption. There was a, a romantic aspect to this law of redemption. There was the law of love being, being held within this law of redemption. And so the point of it was, you know, you can't enjoy land, even if you own it, if you don't have a family. To live on, you know, nobody wants to uh, just live in a lonely old house uh, without family their whole life, and so, so God would assure a family name to continue by telling the brother of of his deceased brother's uh, his deceased brother's widow to marry his deceased brother's widow if she had not reproduced offspring, in order to make sure that they would have kids to be able to reproduce in order to live on that family property. Okay, so and so coming into Ruth chapter 4, Boaz intends to marry Ruth because both Naomi and Ruth are, are widows who have no sons. And so he's, he's willing to perpetuate the family name of Ruth. Now the question again is not whether or not Ruth and Naomi will be redeemed because Boaz already told us that he is willing. The question is who will redeem Naomi and Ruth. Will it be this no-name guy, or will it be Boaz? Who's, who's it going to be? Now, I want to reflect on, on this concept of, of this legality that we see happening in chapter 4. Because, remember, the whole resolution of Ruth and Naomi's empty situation is going to be resoluted through redemption, which is a law. And the whole marriage between Boaz and Ruth is going to happen because of this law of redemption. And so it's all happening um, in, in a court way, in a legal manner. And so I couldn't help but you know, think we all need, we need exactly what Ruth and Naomi desperately need. 
Um, for all of our problems, we need, a res we need a legal resolution. right? For all of our sin against God, we've acquired a debt. And the wages of our debt, of our, the wages of our sin is death. Right? Romans 3.23 says that. The wages of our sin is death. And so we're in an empty spot. And if the wages of sin is death, which, by the way, means breaking God's law, it's a lawful thing. Sin, co sin comes as a result of breaking God's law. Do not steal, do not lie, do not disobey your parents. And so we've all, we're all in a, a heap of debt called death. And with death means we have no future, we have no family name that will continue at some point because we'll die. And we have no land because we're going to die. And so we need redeemed. Just like Ruth and Naomi need redeemed. And the way that we're redeemed is in a legal way. We need justified of our wrong, we need forgiven of our sin, and we need redeemed lawfully from our pitiful pit. Because we, like Naomi and Ruth, have no future without a Redeemer. Absolutely none. As, as Ephesians 1, 7 says, I, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And so, Boaz is about to purchase Naomi, uh, Naomi's land and buy Ruth to be his wife. But when Jesus redeems us, he redeems us through his blood. I think it, it, we also need to understand that love is a legal man, matter. Have you ever thought about love is a legal matter before it is even an emotional matter? Um, that's so important for us. Love is a legal matter. Boaz is marrying Ruth because of the law of redemption. Reminds me of Romans 13, 8 to 10, which says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. They fulfilled the law. Love comes from the law. For the commandments say, You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All right, so love is a law. And in Ruth 4, Boaz demonstrates how love is a law by seeking to marry Ruth in a legal, redemptive way. Now, this is important for us to grasp because it tells us that, first, we can't be loved by God until we are redeemed by God. Do you realize you can't be loved by God until you allow him to redeem you from your sins which means you're going to come underneath of his rulership in your life. He's going to buy you. You cannot be redeemed or loved until you are redeemed by God. Second, because love, love is a legal issue, it means um, God can't stop loving us. If God loves you because he's redeemed you, that means he's bought you with a price. And he can't stop loving you because for God to stop loving you would mean that God breaks his law. And God is perfect. God will not break his law. So it doesn't matter how you feel. If, if you feel like God does not love you, he loves you. Because it's a legal matter. And it doesn't fall on your feelings. It falls on the law. God loves you. He can't break his law. Boaz shows, it, shows us that as he marries Ruth in a legal, redemptive way. It comes from Old Testament law. Now there's a way of redemption that we can see happening in Ruth chapter 4. Maybe you've asked, how, how are we practically redeemed? Well, this is pretty neat to just see how Boaz redeems Ruth. So, check it out with me. In verse 1, we can see how redemption comes through a divine way. It, redemption always comes in a divine way. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and he sat down. You see... Redemption is happening in a, in a divine way here because the night before, Boaz was sleeping and he had no plans of marrying Ruth or redeeming Ruth uh, until Ruth came and proposed to him. He didn't plan this court date. It was spontaneous. He just went there and the, the, the court date just kind of happened. It happened immediately. It just so happened to bump into uh, this other redeemer in order to make this court scene happen. That doesn't happen in legal matters, does it? When you plan a court date, it might take months to actually establish that. And until it's all said and done, maybe even years at times. And certainly, um, the court proceeding will take more than just a few minutes. And yet, 
In Ruth chapter 4, this happens so quickly. Ruth just so happens to bump into this guy, and the court scene happens, and it's done before you know it. What's so important about that is, is, is for us to know that, that Jesus, he, he controls our legal standing before him. And he makes it happen just like that. When you need flown out of your, your pit of sin through the wings of Jesus, he can do it immediately. God can set up a court date between you and God immediately where he redeems you and he justifies you. And he forgives you if you just ask. He does it immediately. God's the one setting up redemption and forgiveness. It reminds me of 1 John 1, 9. What happens when we sin? Because we continue to sin, right? Confess your sins, John says. Confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Just like that. And then think of what Matthew 9, 2 says. Uh, in Matthew 9, 2, Jesus tells the paralyzed man, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. You see, it only takes the word of Jesus to say that your sins are forgiven, you've been redeemed, I'm going to save you out of that pit again, and you are redeemed, you are forgiven. Because we rest in the sovereignty of God, uh, of God redeeming us. Now you might ask, why Boaz finds such good immediate um, action to his, his desire to set up this court date and redeem Ruth? You know, how does it happen so quick? It, it, verse 1 actually happens in response to verse 13, where Boaz says, As the Lord lives, I will redeem you, he says to you. As the Lord lives, I will redeem you. He's making an oath by saying, As the Lord lives, I will redeem you, meaning the Lord will help me redeem you. And it's no different for us. As the Lord lives, Jesus Christ will redeem you. How do we know that? Well, he's given us an oath signed with his blood. We count on Jesus to redeem us alone. In verses 2 to 4, we see how redemption comes through an offer of love. Okay, God's redemption will come through an offer of love, just like Boaz's redemption will come through this offer of love. Listen to what he says. He says, and, and so Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Okay, so Boaz is offering his no-name man, this other closer redeemer, an opportunity to redeem Naomi's property. He doesn't mention Ruth yet. Because this other man has first dibs on it. <clears throat> but if this other man doesn't redeem the property, Boaz is saying, clearly, I am willing to redeem it. I will redeem it. Alright, so... This is an important note to make at this point. Ruth and Naomi's fate will rest on this court phase, this court, this, this court proceeding. But the question up for grab is not whether or not they will be redeemed. It is who will redeem them. They will be redeemed by either this other guy or Boaz. But the question is who will, who will redeem them? Okay, who's going to redeem them? And I think the question is also the same with us. It's not whether or not you will be redeemed, but who will you trust to redeem you? Who is going to redeem you? And is that person who, who, who redeems you somebody who's going to love you, a loving redeemer, or a lousy redeemer? Well, as you're going to see, this no man land is a lousy redeemer. He doesn't, as you'll find, he doesn't really want proof. So look at verses 5 and 6. In verses 5 and 6, we see how redemption is going to come through willing love. It's going to come through willing love. You're going to see Boaz speaking with diplomacy here. He, he hit something within the deal. He didn't mention Ruth, and so he's going to bring out, um, you know, something that deals are notorious for doing, hiding something in fine print. Well, Boaz comes out with a fine print here, and he said, The day that you buy the field, Mr. So-and-so, from the hand of Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabite, 
the widow of the dead in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. All right, so in other words, this, this other man wanted the real estate, but he didn't want Ruth. He wanted the property, but he didn't want the person. And he knew that Ruth would impair his inheritance. He was a business guy. He, he, he was looking for a good deal, but he didn't want Ruth. So he's out. Just like that, he's out. On the other hand, Boaz wants both the land and the person. He wants Ruth. So I think this, this causes us to, to, to pause for some applications and for reflections. God made me think, what kind of redeemer do I have? Do I have Boaz? A man like Boaz who wants me for me? Or do I have no man guy who just wants me for my property? The thing is, I can assure you, each one of us always look for a redeemer. Big R redeemer or small R redeemer who will save us out of our trouble because we all have a pit of problems. Whether that be directly related to sin or indirectly related to the curse that sin has brought upon the whole world. We have, we have problems, okay? Name a problem that you have in your heart. When you're like, what's the problem? Maybe it's health. Maybe it's family. <clears throat> Maybe it's just like Naomi and Ruth. You don't see a future for your family. Maybe it's widowhood, okay? Well, we have a choice to, as to who we trust for our Redeemer. Who's going to save us out of our problem? Is it going to be our personality? Some people have strong personalities that can kind of save them out of any problem. Is it our health? Are you counting on your health? Are you counting on your job? Are you counting on your family? Because you have a good family, and they're going to redeem you out of all of your problems. Or are you relying on your own self-pity? Sometimes our own emotions can become our own form of, of redemption. However, there's really only one redeemer who can save you, and that's the one who is, who is willing to redeem you and to stay with you. And, and to, to marry you. That is to commit himself in love to you. That's this man, Boaz. He, he's, not, he's, not just, he's not just buying the property of Naomi and Ruth, but he's, he wants to save Naomi and Ruth. The second question I want to ask you is, what kind of character are you? Are you more like this Boaz figure, or are you more like this no-name guy? You see, Boaz was willing here to extend the family name of Naomi and Ruth, which we know brings forth the lineage of Jesus Christ. In other words, Boaz was willing to bring Jesus into the world. He was willing to live his life for the family name of Jesus Christ. No name, no name guy is not given a name because he's living for his own name. He's living in order to perpetuate the family name of himself. And so what happens is he falls off the pages of Scripture just as soon as he enters them. Because without living your life in order to further the name of Jesus Christ, your life has no purpose and no continuation. So, which one are you? You know, no, no name guy is kind of like Orpah in chapter 1. She is headed back to Bethlehem and God's people, but she turns back to go and serve her other gods. And so she falls off the pages of Scripture. So let me just ask you this. Who, whose name are you living to represent? And if indeed you are, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit that Jesus Christ's name is being, is, is, is being reproduced through you? That's this man Boaz, willing to reproduce the family lineage of Jesus Christ. Well, verses 7 to 10, we see, how, we see how redemption is going to come through a transaction of love. Okay, because redemption always comes with a transaction. When, when God redeems you and buys you out of your problems, he does it with a transaction. He does it with a transaction. Now, this transaction, you'll see in verses 7 to 8, has an action to it, and in verses 9 to 10, it has a purpose to it. Let's look at the action first. So, Mr. So-and-so and Boaz exchange a sandal. And, and the author, the narrator, sets us up for this kind of tradition. Apparently, the readers at the time of the narrator uh, or writer writing this 
weren't familiar with the laws and customs of Israel either. So he says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To, to confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Okay, so there's this transaction. They didn't have paper and ink, but they had sandals. All right, so likewise, um, for us, love and redemption really is a transaction. It's a transaction. And you know, the more ties that you have into your relationship with God it means the more security that you have. It's the same thing with marriage. Marriage has a transaction involved where, where marriage is a legal issue, a physical issue, a public issue, a symbolic issue, a traditional issue. And that is just to, to make sure that you are locked into life and it's very hard to break. It's bonding you together. Well, when, when God saves us and redeems us and loves us, he sends his Holy Spirit into us. That's a transaction. Of course, there isn't any sandal going back and forth. But he sends his Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.14 the Holy Spirit is called a down payment, a deposit of guarantee. So that Holy Spirit is God's way of saying, I, I'm so interested in you, I'm not leaving you. I call it, it's the engagement ring of, of God. You know, he's, he's showing, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to you, I will marry you. And so uh, even in our relationship with God, you can be assured he will redeem you again and again and again. He will continue to love you and stay with you because he's given you his Holy Spirit. Now, in verses 9 to 10, we see what the purpose of this transaction is. And it, it should answer the question for us, what is the purpose in redemption? What's the purpose? Well, Boaz makes it very clear that he, he wasn't a man primarily in, interested in just land. But he was more interested in Mary and Ruth helping Naomi and continuing family lineage. Read this with me. Verses 9 to 10, it says, Then, then Boaz said to all the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses to this today. So I want you to notice the way of this redemption and the reason for this redemption as it as it tells us exactly how God redeems us too. Well, the way of redemption was Boaz bought both the land and Ruth. Notice the word bought in verse 9 and bought in verse 10. He bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech. And we're told in verse 10 that he bought Ruth to be his wife. Okay? So there's buying happening here. Because when you are redeemed, the way that God does it is he buys you and he purchases you with his blood. So much so that 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Because you no longer belong to yourself. Naomi and Ruth, in being redeemed, are, are setting themselves up to fall under the, the, the lordship and the master role of Boaz. Likewise, when we are redeemed, when we allow Jesus to buy us, it means we are allowing him to become our owner. He owns us. Now, the reasons for redemption that, that, that Boaz gives are threefold. Um, first, he, he, is, he is buying the, the land of Naomi. You can see that. Um, and so it, it, is, it is a land issue. Right? Without land, right, it, it's, it's very hard to enjoy family. Have you ever tried to travel with kids on the road? I'm just learning how to do that, and it's hard. So it's nice to have a land in order to live with family. So no doubt about it, he's purchasing their land. Likewise, uh, we're told uh, that, you know, that, that God gives us an inheritance called land when he redeems. Matthew 5, 5 says, says, Blessed are the weak, or blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so, yeah, Boaz is, is purchasing land, and, and when God redeems you, he gives you land in the future. Who, whose land is it, though? That's a question. Whose land does God give you? Well, Hebrews 1, 2 tells us that it's, it's, it's God's land. When God redeems you, he's, he's redeeming God's land. In Hebrews 1, 2, Jesus is called the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. For that reason, Ephesians 1, 11 tells us that in him we have obtained an inheritance. And that inheritance, inheritance is God's land. It's it's the world that belongs to Jesus. But the second reason that Boaz is, is redeeming Ruth and Naomi is, is for them. It is, it is for them. 
And when God redeems us, it is for us. We are the inheritance of Jesus. In, in Ephesians 1.18, Paul says a prayer, and he prays that the Ephesian believers would understand what are the riches of his, of his glorious inheritance in the saints. <coughs> Catch that. He's saying, I hope you understand what is God's glorious inheritance in the saints, meaning we are God's inheritance. He wants us. When God redeems you, he redeems you because he wants you for you. He doesn't just want what you can give him. He wants you for you. And then finally, um, the purpose of Boaz's redemption, just like the purpose of Jesus Christ redeeming us, is in order to perpetuate the name of God through us. You can hear Boaz saying that as he says, I bought Ruth to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of the native people. Boaz is concerned with family longevity, just as you and I are too. We want to live on and on and on, and we want to live a legacy, right? Now, when Jesus redeems us, he redeems us, not for our family name, but for his family name. We enter into his family name. If you ever ask yourself, why does God redeem me? You might think, he buys me because just for me. Just for me. That's not totally true. It's half true. When God saves you and redeems you, Jesus is doing that in order to continue the name of Jesus, to continue the name of his Father. You can hear that in Jesus' prayer in John 17. He's very concerned about keeping the disciples in his Father's name. So why did God redeem you? Again, he redeemed you so that you can live for him and so that the name of Jesus can long, long, long continue. Let me end with just some, some reflections on what this court scene means for us. Remember that your greatest resolution that you need is a legal resolution. It's a romantic, redemptive resolution with God. And that's what you need in order to be loved. Everything happens in a, in a, in a legal way. For instance, how do you become adopted into the family of God? In a legal way. Galatians 4, 4 to 5 says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those from under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In order for you to be loved, you need to be loved in a family. In order to be loved in a family, you need to be adopted in a legal way into that family. Jesus provides that for us in a redemptive way. And how did he do it? Well, he died for us in a legal way. In Colossians 2, 3 to 4, 13 to 14, it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses, right, legally breaking God's law, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. When God redeems you and when God loves you, he does it legally because that's what you need for breaking God's law. You need legal love. You need legal redemption. Second, we can, we can, we can glory in the fact through uh, Ruth chapter 4 that Jesus controls our legal standing before him completely. Just as you see Boaz controlling the court scene in Ruth chapter 4. Notice how every character is responding to Ruth, uh, to Boaz's words. In verse 1, he, he tells the Redeemer, um, turn aside, friend, and sit down. And he turned aside. He sit, sat down. And then Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And then the rest of uh, the chapter of this court scene has Boaz giving 93 words and his counterparts only speaking 19 because Boaz is controlling the court scene here. He is controlling the destiny of Ruth and, and Naomi, just like Jesus completely controls your destiny. He controls your redemption. He controls filling you up with good things, and he will surely do it. You know, when we break God's law, what can we do about it? Can we talk our way out of it? No. We need Jesus to be the guy who talks us out of it. Can we work our way out of it? No. We can't work our way out of our lawful problem. We can't give God community service just like Ruth and Naomi couldn't do anything in order to save their, their 
their empty widowhood. They could do nothing. Ruth was a hard worker. You know that, by the way, that she demonstrated work ethic. But that wasn't saving her. She needed Boaz to redeem her. And we need Jesus to redeem us. Romans 3.19 says it this way. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So we, like Ruth and Naomi, need to allow our faith to completely be controlled by Jesus, just as Naomi and Ruth have their faith controlled by Boaz. Lastly, very lastly, I want you to notice how Ruth's fate rests on the outcome of this judicial scene. Yet, the narrator focuses all the attention on Boaz. Naomi and Ruth are standing in the background. I don't even know where, where they are in this, in this court scene. They're somewhere. But all the attention is on Boaz. Just like all of our attention needs to be on Jesus, the justifier of our own, uh, the advocate on our behalf. So I want to I remind you to trust in Jesus today as your judicial man who saves you from the wrath of God, who redeems you from your pit. Uh, Psalm 103, it says, and, and, and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Not only is God going to redeem you, he's going to stay with you. He's going to crown you with his love and crown you with your mercy. Just like you see Boaz sticking with Ruth and Naomi as he not only redeems them, but he marries Ruth, he bears a child with her, Boaz is here to stay with Ruth forever. And when Jesus Christ redeems you, focus on him because all of the attention belongs on him. And yet, he as a servant, like Boaz, will do everything that he does for you because that's who Jesus is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that Boaz is the man of chapter 4 and he is just guiding every single conversation and uh, guiding the outcome of Ruth and Naomi's life. And God, I thank you that, that Jesus is that man to us as, as he's our advocate. He's the one who justifies us. Um, the one who makes now no condemnation between us and God. And Father, I just pray that, that we wouldn't feel guilty when we aren't guilty. And God, when we do sin, we praise you that we can quickly confess our sins, you are automatically faithful and just to forgive us. God, you can just snap your fingers together, call up a court scene, and Jesus Christ is there to acquit us. God, we thank you for that peace that we have with you, that it's said and done. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.